This is Steve Zeltzer with Work Week, and I'm with uh, uh, Scott Holderson, who uh, is a auto worker at Ford in Chicago, uh, local 551 of the UAW. And Scott has been engaged in a struggle in the UAW to fight for democracy um, against the corruption of the uh, leadership of the UAW, and has organized with others a campaign to have direct election and other issues in the UAW. Welcome to Work Week, Scott. Hey, thanks for having me, Steve. Appreciate it. So, Scott, why don't you talk about what's been happening in the UAW? As uh, most people know who cover labor, uh, many of the officials, top officials of the UAW, have been uh, either convicted or investigated for taking money from the company or, or nonprofits. Uh, what is happening in the UAW at this point with this whole corruption crisis? Well, there's there's been several different schemes of uh, uh, corruption. Some have involved our dues money. Some have involved taking money from the corporations uh, that that they negotiate with. Uh, that's where it started in, in uh, Fiat Chrysler. There was one of the vice presidents of our union, uh, Norwood Jewell, just started his prison sentence for taking bribes from Fiat Chrysler officials. So far there's been uh, like 10 different uh, UA, uh, UAW officials and officers that have pled guilty. And what were they doing in return for the bribes from the company? They were smoothing the, uh, the skids for better contracting, uh, better contract terms. So they were basically making, uh, pushing concessions on the workers uh, while they were getting uh, bribes and other benefits from the company. Yeah, that's that's what he pled guilty to. And what is what kind of atmosphere has that led to in the UAW? Uh, a, a lot of contracts have been opposed by the rank and file. Are, are members uh, unhappy about what's going, been going on? Well, a lot of members are. There's, you know, morale is down uh, because of it. Uh, but also, uh, you know, there's there's been a, a number of members that have uh, decided to stand up and fight back. And the structure of the UAW, you've been involved, you've gone to uh, past conventions. How is the structure inhibiting the membership from having real control over the union? Well, the, uh, the structure is such that our international executive board is elected by the delegates to the, con- to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, those delegates are elected by their their members, but there's very little that the members can do to learn how their their delegates voted on anything from uh, you know the dues structure to uh, who they voted for for uh, you know, international offices. And this labor management partnership, which has been the position of the UAW for decades. Uh, in the post-war period, does this have something to do with the corruption going on in the UAW? Well, I certainly believe so. Uh, you know, in the early 1980s, the UAW had a paradigm sh- shift uh, from confrontation with the, the companies to cooperation. Uh, they felt that if the companies were stronger, that it would be beneficial to the workers as well. And that, that paradigm shift uh, has ultimately led to the the union being co-opted by the companies in many respects, and uh, the method of which we elect our leaders has led to, in, in many respects, to them feeling like they don't have have to be accountable to the membership. Well, I was at a a meeting in uh, UC Berkeley actually where Bob King spoke. And it was interesting that he said that uh, he was uh, concerned about protecting the profit of the auto companies. Do you think that should be a concern of the union? The, the union's concern should be that the uh, workers are getting their fair share of the profit. It's, it's not our concern that the companies make the profits because the companies have too much control over day-to-day operations of those. You know, we, we, we can't control, you know, investment choices. Uh, we can't control which, which plants they decide to build or close. We haven't been able to control it anyway. You know, so this partnership is a one-way partnership, and uh, I'm surprised that 
it has gotten to this this point without the membership rising up. But now we're beginning to see that that the members are taking notice and starting to rise up and and uh, hopefully take back our union. And how is this organization taking place? And and what are the uh, demands that you're making on the union for change? Well, it, it started with a small group of activists who were upset with the the things that were being exposed in the in the press. Uh, you know, the government came in and, and was able to find out things that the membership couldn't find out. As those things were exposed, uh, we started looking at our constitution and seeing what remedies we had uh, as members that we could that we could utilize. We found a few different clauses uh, where we could take action, and and we started to organize action around those clauses. So one of those was to file charges against an international officer. In order to do that, you needed to have somebody sign a, a sworn affidavit about the charges they were filing, and then you had to have the endorsement of that person's local plus the endorsement of 10 other locals. Now, the International Executive Board could step in at any time with a two-thirds vote and do the same thing. Well, we had uh, organized to eventually get six locals on board, and when that came out in the news, the very next day, the International uh, Executive Board filed their charges against uh, President Gary Jones and uh, Regional Director Vance Pearson. And they both ended up resigning their, their membership after that happened. And what were the charges against Gary Jones? It was uh, essentially misuse of uh, union union money, union dues, and uh, the, the schemes, there's a couple of schemes that he was involved with, but they were essentially having a three-day conference in Palm Springs, California. But that three-day conference would turn into uh, several months of them staying in Palm Springs with uh, being paid for completely, uh, including meals, including cigars, including golf, uh, all of it was paid for uh, with union union funds. And they tried to hide it by uh, charging it all to the conference, the three-day conference. And was this an isolated situation, or how many uh, officials have been involved in this? It seems like it's uh, growing by the day well there's there's been several different schemes we this is the second one that we've talked about here uh the first one of course was the bribery uh at fiat chrysler uh there are also uh schemes for demanding kickbacks from vendors who are supplying uh trinkets to you know whether it be t-shirts or jackets or backpacks or pens watches, uh, you know, they were inflating the prices, having the vendor inflate the prices and then pay them kickbacks. Uh, that's what uh, former Vice President Joe Ashton uh, is caught up in right now. So there's several different ways that they found to uh, basically line their pockets at the expense of the, the members, because this money was coming from member training funds. And the government now has put a number of people in prison of the UAW and is continuing this criminal investigation. Are you concerned that the government may try to say that this is a criminal enterprise and take it over, take for the government to take the UAW over as a criminal syndicate? Oh, oh we certainly are concerned about that. And that's led to uh, the effort that we have going on right now. Uh, under our Constitution, the membership can call for a special convention, uh, but it's a, it's a very onerous process. Uh, it requires that, first of all, you get a resolution passed that includes a specific date and location for the convention and the purpose for the convention. And if you get that passed at uh, 15 different locals, in five different states representing 20 percent of the membership then it becomes a referendum vote of all of the membership 
uh, on whether we hold this special convention. Uh, we Right now we have that process going on. It's in process. Uh, so far we have 18 different locals that have signed on in, in like nine different states, but we're uh, a little more than 10% of the membership, so we're uh, about halfway to the to the goal of have, of actually getting the referendum vote. And what are those officials who are against this argue? Why are they opposing it when rank and file members bring it up? They oppose it. I, I've heard several different things, but uh, mostly uh, they uh, oppose it, saying, "Well, you know, so many of our members voted for Trump," uh, or. Um, you know, basically, they're saying they don't trust their members. Uh, also, they say, how do you camp- campaign to all these different people in, in all across the country to run for international office? And the funny thing is that the steel workers and the machinists and the teamsters all do the same thing. I think the postal workers as well. And you're talking about a direct election of uh, the officers of the union. Yes, a direct election of the officers of the at the international level of the union. And I understand that even the U.S. attorney who's been prosecuting the UAW has suggested that there be direct election. Is that true? Uh, he has said that that's uh, one of the things that they uh, would consider uh, if you know a RICO uh, case is filed against the against the union. Uh, they haven't come out and said that, yes, they would do that, but they said that's that's a possibility. So, And what are the reasons you're opposed to a government takeover? I know uh, there are workers who support Trump, but what do you think the effect of a government takeover would mean for the UAW? Well, that's, that's the unknown, right? Uh, we've seen the National uh, Labor Relations Board uh, that Trump has put into place uh, overturning uh, lots of uh, precedent in labor law, and they continue to uh, attack uh, our ability to uh, to organize and to uh, form new uh, or you know have more union membership. It also attacks our ability to represent members. So we're, we're concerned about it. We do, it's in part the unknown. You know, we know that Trump is a businessman. And that he has not been in the uh, in his business dealings. He's not been exactly uh, a friend of workers. Uh, he's been actually rather anti-union. And uh, same thing with the uh, uh, U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District of uh, Michigan. Uh, he's he was selected from the list from the Federalist Society. Uh, he was sworn in to that position at a meeting of the Federalist Society. And the Federalist Society, uh, what are their views? They're, they're a very right-wing uh, portion of the uh, legal system. Um, and, you know, we're, we're just concerned about uh, what a government uh, takeover of our union would look like. And, uh, you know, we, we'd like to avoid that if at all possible. And we're hoping that by democratizing our union, that we would have the opportunity to show that we're actually working to reform our union ourselves rather than need the government to come in and do it. And I I believe the Federal Society, OSHA, and government agencies intervening in (coughs) workplaces to to protect workers around health and safety and those issues. Correct. Now, recently the USMCA passed the United States-Mexico-Canadian Trade Agreement, and workers in Mexico were trying to organize at the Saleo plant in uh, Puebla. The U.S. government, uh, Trump said it's a great victory for working people. What do you think about the USMCA? I, I think it's, it's really just NAFTA uh, warmed over and spit back out, basically. There were some marginal improvements on requirements of certain wage parity uh, with workers in Mexico. And the problem is most of the language dealing with workers or environmentalism, you know, protecting our environment, that language has no teeth to it, and it's hard to enforce. Uh, whereas the, the corporation's rights are enforced uh, quite vigorously. Do you think that the U.S. government is going to protect the right of Mexican workers to organize and, and build independent unions? Well, I mean, if uh, past is prelude, then uh, obviously not. That's a question. I mean, I don't think that the U.S. government is 
stopping the firing of workers in the United States who try to organize unions. I doubt that uh, they're going to be doing that in Mexico, and especially right. with General Motors. What kind of relationship should there be between U.S. auto workers and auto workers in Mexico and other countries? Uh, we should be building bridges to, uh, of solidarity with uh, auto workers and workers uh, in other countries, uh, especially in Mexico and Canada. They're our closest uh, neighbors, and we have more in common than, than we have uh, in, as differences. Uh, our main differences with Mexican workers is language uh, and also a, an imaginary border between our countries. And some General Motors workers, when there was a General Motors strike, uh, had some solidarity action. They didn't want to work overtime uh, to help GM and also they were against outsourcing. Seven of them were fired. Was there any information by the UAW International about the support by the Mexican GM workers for the strike? No, there was no information about that. In fact, the UAW International was, was it was hard to get information about our, our own efforts. They, uh, they didn't give any, anything in detail about what was being negotiated, why they, uh, the workers were on strike, just very uh, generalized statements. But the workers that were on strike at General Motors they knew what they were on strike for. They were on strike for uh, equity. They wanted to end the abuse of uh, temporary workers and the practice of using temporary workers, you know, for an extended period of time. At, at some plants, you have, they've actually allowed the contracting out of operations, cleanup workers, Aramark workers. What's that all about? Uh, that was agreed to by the UAW uh, during the uh, Great Recession. And, you know, once we lose lose that work, it's very difficult to get it back in plant. Those those jobs often went to high seniority workers uh, as they were nearing the end of their, their career. Now they're being farmed out to uh, companies who hire people at a uh, much lower wage scale. And the auto industry is a global industry. There are now probably maybe more cars produced in China of GM than in the United States. How do you see organizing internationally with these companies and possibly fighting globally uh, of joint actions of uh, all GM workers or all Ford workers at a global level? Well, that's going to be a necessity, Steve. Um, you know, the, the companies have long ago uh, decided to organize themselves uh, globally. And when workers don't organize themselves globally, we leave ourselves at a at a disadvantage to the company and you know that disadvantage has led to a lower standard of living for workers all across the globe over the last few decades and uh, if we're going to reverse it we need to build solidarity bridges uh, across national borders and how can workers and locals get in touch with you and the others who are trying to get uh, direct uh, democracy in the UAW well we've uh, started an organization called UAWD uh, Unite All Workers for Democracy. And you can find our website at uawd.org. And also we have a Facebook page uh, called Unite All Workers for Democracy. Okay, well, I want to thank uh, you, Scott, for participating in this interview. I'm talking with Scott Holderson. He's an auto worker at uh, Ford in Chicago, local UAW Local 551. Very good. Take care. Bye-bye.